Bienvenidos and welcome to our conversation on migration narratives, policy and power. We're excited to have you all join us today for an expert panel and conversation on the topic of global migration narratives and how they affect policy. My name is Chantel Stewart. I'm a member of Metropolitan Group and I will be your MC for today's conversation as well as your in-house tech support. So if during this webinar you have any technical difficulties, please chat directly to the panelists and I'll jump right in to assist you. We'd like for this to be more of a discussion. So as you have questions or comments, please type them into the chat box and we'll get to as many of them as we can through the course of the conversation. If you have questions for a specific panelist, please be sure to include their names in the chat. Also, Zoom has recently added an accessibility feature, so you should see an icon for live transcript at the bottom of your Zoom window. If you click that and choose the bottom link, Enable Auto Transcription, you should begin to see that Zoom will transcribe audio from this session in real time. We'd also like you to know that this webinar is being simultaneously interpreted into Spanish by our interpreter, Carlos Calderon. If you go to the bottom of your Zoom window, you'll see a globe icon. Simply click on this icon and click the language that you'd like to hear spoken. So for example, if you'd like to listen to this conversation in Spanish, please click the globe and select Spanish. If Rodolfo, our moderator, switches to Spanish, please select English and Carlos will simultaneously interpret into English. You could also select off to hear the conversation as is with no interpretation. As per usual, we encourage you to live tweet if you'd like using the hashtags power of voice or migration narratives. Please be sure to tag and follow us on Twitter and Instagram at MetGroup. Thank you so much for joining us, and we are excited to get this conversation started. Without further ado, I'd like to introduce you all to our moderator for today's event, Rodolfo Cordova Alcaraz, Executive Vice President at Impacto Social Metropolitan Group. Thanks very much, Chantel. Welcome, everyone. Uh, my name is Rodolfo Cordova, and I'm Executive Vice President for Impacto Social Metropolitan Group, and also Social Justice Co-Lead for uh, both Med Group and Impacto Social. And I'll be facilitating today's conversation. So why migration and why narratives on this specific issue? Today, every seventh person in the world is a migrant, either internal or international. Who doesn't know someone who is a migrant or has migrated? Uh, this topic is important at the moment that we're in. As decisions made today, after the global pandemic will have consequences for societies for decades to come. With the number of migrants expected to rise from the impacts of inequality, economic disparities, climate change and conflict, there is a new urgency to understand how positive and negative narratives about migration develop, spread and take root. Today's conversation aims to advance in this direction. And what do we mean when we use the word narrative? Please join me watching this video to find the answer. The narratives we're exposed to every day reflect a way of seeing the world. Repeated often enough, they can create and reinforce social norms. Hearing a narrative over and over, especially from people in authority, can silence other narratives and become the dominant narrative, accepted as being just the way things are. Narratives shape what we see and how we see issues, defining problems and identifying solutions. And they often validate or sustain the status quo, reinforcing power and privilege for those who already have it. For generations, narratives about gender defined systems and policies that reinforce the stereotype of women as inferior, cementing the inequality that still exists between people of different genders. Narratives about Native and Indigenous peoples often reflect a history of colonialism that portrays them as passive, instead of people with power and rights, making their struggles and contributions invisible. Narratives about people with disabilities often focus on their limitations in a world designed for people without disabilities, failing to reflect their autonomy and control over their own lives. 
Advocates for social justice and human rights are often portrayed by people in power as being extreme or even subversive. In a culture that values justice and respect for authority, punishment of people with different ideas can become acceptable. The news media, what is taught in school, music and movies, what we hear from celebrities, the language and symbols in our art and advertising, even our public monuments and the design of our cities all communicate narrative. People are more likely to pick up and carry a narrative when it connects with values they already hold, when it affirms what they already believe, especially when it's communicated by messengers they trust. For example, some people have selectively used medical science to stigmatize and marginalize trans and non-binary people. Confronting a dominant or false narrative might not be easy, but it is possible. New narratives are being designed and advanced every day by social change advocates all over the world. Learn more about narrative as a key to unlock social change by visiting metgroup.com slash narratives. Narratives shape the way we see what surround us and what we think, believe, and do. Migration narratives are the collection of stories that make up how people see or experience migration or immigrants. Hence, how we see and talk about migration is intimately connected to the design and implementation of policies that affect not just newcomers, but the well being of communities and societies as a whole. That said, it's a pleasure to introduce four leaders who have dedicated their lives to better understand migration and the impact it has on migrants, refugees, their families and communities. I'm joined today by Ali Nurani, President and CEO of the National Immigration Forum, Natalia Banulescu Bogdan, Associate Director of the Migration Policy Institute's International Program, Haim Malka, my colleague and friend, Metropolitan Group Vice President, who leads our work on migration, and Shelley Culverstone from Rand Corporation, senior policy researcher. Before passing it to Ali, just to say that we are very excited to be joined by people from across the US and Mexico and other countries and regions. This shows the relevance of today's conversation. And remember, feel free to share your questions and comments in the chat. And while you're listening, we invite you to think and reflect on how this conversation applies to your work. Ali, can you please kick this off by sharing why migration narratives are important and how narratives shape immigration policy? Sure, well, I mean, first of all, I really wanna thank uh, our partners at the Metropolitan Group, um, the Rand Corporation and the Migration Policy Institute. This has been just a, a really exciting and a fruitful partnership to be looking at the global migration, at global migration narratives. And even just in this first phase of research, um, and what we found is really kind of exci is exciting in terms of being able to identify and underscore the importance of the work ahead. So why are we looking at the connection between a migration narrative and um, immigration policy? So, you know, many of you probably have heard me, you know, kind of, you know, share this rants before, uh, is that, you know, in the domestic immigration policy space here in the States, Oftentimes, you know, for too long, our talking points ended at the border. Um, and as a result, we failed to realize that a large number of Americans, and I would argue that a large number of people around the world, their uh, uh, kind of understanding of domestic immigration policy was informed by their perception of migration at a national level, much less migration at a global level. In fact, in 2017, Eric Kaufman, uh, wrote a book called uh, White Shift. Um, and in, you know, he did a number of studies and kind of both new research that he performed, but also other research. And he makes this case that, you know, again, kind of the perception that somebody has uh, um, of migration at a national and global level really overpowers their experience and their uh, reaction to their experience of immigration at a very local level. Um, so as a result, you know, we feel that in order to make the a better case for immigrants, immigration, much less immigration policy. We need to uh, much better. We have a, have to. We need to have a much deeper understanding of how 
global migration narratives are weaponized uh, by the forces who would frankly like to see whether it's the US or any other nation become much more restrictionist and nativeness, nativist in terms of their approach to immigration or migration policy. Um, so, you know, we, and you'll hear many more details about this from Natalia, Haim and, and Shelley, but I think the importance of, of, you know, being able to distill where migration narratives are emerging from, who is driving them, um, and then ultimately, as we move, continue to move through this project, how those narratives and those messengers are influencing policy frameworks, much less policy change, um, I think really informs the advocacy work or even the programs, programmatic services work that we all are doing today, much less need to be doing in the months and the years ahead. So that's why it's just so exciting to have, you know, nearly 100 folks, you know, on this conversation um, who are, are, you know, want to, want to share and, and kind of not just see what we've learned so far, um, but be a part of the discussion in terms of how do we shape this project moving forward um, so that we continue to learn lessons that inform all of our work, whether we're advocates, service providers, policymakers, or uh, our funders. So again, I really appreciate the opportunity uh, to be a part of this conversation today. And uh, on behalf of the National Immigration Forum, we're just terribly excited about um, not just what we've found in this phase one, but um, the work ahead. Thank you, Ali. And you're just making me think about now that the conversation is again on the table no, around the regional migration and the need of regional responses, no, and not only focus on, on domestic policies. Uh, I think that's again on the table and it's exciting times no, in, in that sense. Um, Natalia, you've been in multiple conversations at the national, regional, and international level on this topic. Uh, can you please share some insights no, on, on how migration narratives take root? Sure. Thank you, Rodolfo. Um, so um, sometimes when we talk about, about narratives, about public perceptions of migrants, we use language that sort of assumes that these things are fixed. Um, we talk about people being either for or against immigration people believing immigration is a cost or a benefit to society. We wonder whether people care more about effects on jobs or identity. Uh, we get kind of hung up in other words um, with, with telling one story. But one of the things that comes across really clearly in the research that we've done so far is there is no one story. Uh, there are many different narratives that, that coexist. And in every community that we looked into, we saw several interlocking stories, um, some receding in importance, others growing in importance, and also influencing each other. And I think it's this process of influencing each other that we, that we don't actually know enough about. Um, so in this ecosystem of, of multiple overlapping, sometimes contradictory stories, the question of which narratives are deemed most, cre most credible, which ones kind of rise to the top and dominate, um, and which are most readily dismissed becomes really important. And you know, we're in this moment with the pandemic where um, you don't have to look very far to see many examples of these contradictions. Um, just looking at the, the newspaper headlines today, um, you know, in the United States, there's a bill before Congress to create a path to citizenship for unauthorized immigrants who served on the, the front lines of the COVID response, the so-called essential workers. Um, there, there's a narrative there that we have a, a moral duty and a sense that there is a real economic benefit as well to help those who kept the country running during the pandemic. At the very same time, you have the Texas governor reviving the narrative linking migrants to disease, attributing a spike in COVID to migrants crossing the southern border and using this to announce a plan to build a border wall. And you see these examples, this sort of push and pull, these competing narratives all over the world. And so I, the point I want to make is that you know, public perceptions are not just formed by the attitudes that we that we all have intrinsically, the values that, that are inside us or by external events that we can point to, but they're very much about 
this process of interpretation, how people contextualize the effects of immigration in their own lives, where they assign blame and responsibility. Um, so, you know, you know how you, you paint the picture of whether migrants steal jobs, add jobs, uh, overburden infrastructure, help the recovery, um, and how people articulate solutions about what should be done. Um, and so we know that the reason certain things take hold or become sticky, you can't, you can't draw a straight line um, from, from why things become dominant to the facts on the ground. So we know that we can't simply show statistics of you know, how many migrant doctors have contributed in emergency rooms or data on you know, the long-term correlation between influx of migrants and spikes in crime and have this really enter the bloodstream of the debate. Um, and so I think what we need to better understand is how these narratives trigger both existing values and anxieties and what makes certain narratives kind of catch fire and others you know, fall below the radar. And this diagnosis is really important because you know, we, we talk a lot about addressing xenophobia, diffusing negative narratives. And this shows us that you need to do more than simply introduce positive narratives. They already exist, we've found them. The challenge is not that there's a void and we need to simply fill it by supplying more information. The challenge is really to understand how and if these messages are resonating. And I'll end there. Thank you, Natalia. This is amazing. I think that you are touching a, a point that it's critical, no? it's in, in the sense that facts are not enough. No? And yeah, what, what you are sharing with us around value, understanding how and if, I think that sets the table for Haim. Haim, uh, you and your colleagues just completed a research study of five countries. Can you tell us uh, about common migration narratives across diverse societies, please? Definitely. Thank you, Rodolfo. And um, I just want to acknowledge that the work that you've done, Rodolfo, over the last decade, both in Mexico and internationally through the Migration Laboratory, has really been not only inspiring, but I think it's paved the way for work on migration narratives more broadly. And it certainly influenced my own thinking about migration narratives. And you can see uh, your ideas also framing the migration narratives initiative and the study that we just completed. So it's really an honor to be here with you in this discussion and with the other panelists that I've been working so closely with over the last few months. One of the really striking trends that we found when studying migration narratives is just how similar they are across very culturally and politically diverse countries. So we looked at five countries. We mapped narrative architectures in the United States, Colombia, Sweden, Morocco, and Lebanon. These are arguably pretty different countries. Um, and we found really um, striking similarities across all of these. I think the most important takeaway for me is that we found that migration narratives are being manipulated and in some cases weaponized to preserve or attain power, to disrupt the status quo, to deepen polarization, which already exists, or to advance lots of other policy objectives that are really unrelated to migration. This is really critical and it has implications far beyond migration policy. And the result is that these weaponized narratives are really preventing rational discourse on migration policy and they're undermining public debate on legitimate concerns that people have around migration and indirect issues that are connected to migration like jobs and borders and healthcare and education and infrastructure. So we're left with these hyper, with this hyper polarization that we're seeing in many countries that's preventing rational debate and discourse and policy choices on migration. So, this isn't random, um, it's not accidental. We're seeing orchestrated narratives with an ecosystem of actors and stakeholders, including politicians, influencers, uh, media personalities, celebrities, 
and that are supporting and advancing these weaponized narratives for specific goals. And these goals can be about exploiting commercial opportunities, about attacking incumbent governments, gaining votes, polarizing populations, weakening political and social institutions, undermining democratic principles, and numerous other examples that we can, that we can mention. So I think this is particularly, particularly dangerous when these narratives are advanced by authoritarian or semi-authoritarian governments or politicians that are trying to undermine democracy, human rights, and basic freedoms. And in some cases, we're seeing connections between weaponized narratives on migration and other weaponized narratives connected to anti-vaccination, climate change denial, um, anti-democratic um, norms. So there's lots of examples. Uh, again, Build the Wall is a prime example of a weaponized narrative that advanced the America First agenda. Natalia mentioned the, govern the governor of Texas, which uh, is using language about uh, migration invasion. Uh, in Lebanon, political leaders affiliated with the Kataya party are talking about migrants and refugees as an existential crisis. So there's lots of examples of this um, from Europe as well, where far right parties are using weaponized narratives around migration to um, advance politically and, and to grow their political base. So again, um, I don't wanna give the impression that positive narratives don't exist. As Natalia mentioned, they're out there. There are welcoming narratives. There are narratives in every country that express solidarity with migrants, that recognize the role of migration as part of national identity and national origin stories, that focus on the contribution of migrants to society. But these, these narratives are not sticking, uh, especially when they're top-down narratives expressed by government leaders. And instead, the dominant narratives that we're hearing are driven by threats and focused on insecurity and uh, threats around economics, around personal safety, around cultural identity. And we're seeing this in every single country. On the economic front, migrants are stealing jobs or migrants are lowering, driving down wages. Or on the security front, migrants uh, contribute to crime and are more prone to, to commit violent crime. Or on the cultural side, migrants are uh, weakening our, our, our culture, uh, undermining our language, our values, our way of life. So in, in many cases, what we're seeing is that these threat narratives can drive a perception of losing control over migration that can be elevated into a perceived existential threat. So in the right mix of circumstances, social, political, economic circumstances, with the right combination of weaponized narratives, it can create this sense among populations that there's an existential threat, that the government has lost control of the borders, uh, that migrants are invite, invading the country. Um, and that sense of an existential threat can lead to tipping points where feelings of acceptance within a society or um, welcoming migrants starts to shift and uh, societies pivot from this neutral or accepting of large scale mi migration to turning against migration and migrants. And we've seen this in Lebanon where there's sort of a hospitality fatigue where the country absorbed uh, about a million Syrian refugees and now people are calling for the return of mi migrants and refugees and, and basically arguing that the country uh, has done a lot but it can't do any more. Uh, and so this tipping point is really critical because authoritarian governments and other malign actors are looking to identify those openings and opportunities and then exploit those tipping points to shift narratives to advance their own goals. So identifying whether there are early warning signs or indicators that can be predictive of these tipping points is really important. Understanding this cycle of narratives, weaponized narratives and the tipping point and the direct impact on society and politics, I think is gonna be really critical moving forward. And what this leads to is, is a real need to develop culturally and politically specific counter narratives that can start to push back on these weaponized narratives so that we can have a more reasoned policy debate that can ultimately lead to policies that protect both migrants and host communities. Thank you. Thanks, Haim. And I think that, um, 
you just kind of start answering the first question that came you know, through the chat. Uh, what can we do to change these narratives? Probably it's not about changing those narratives, but how we can develop contrary narratives, uh, you know, as you were saying. Uh, before um, going to the Q&A, uh, I would like to pass it to Shelly. Um, Shelly, um, I mean, you have a lot of experience no, in international response to mass migration. Can you please tell us more about that based on no, your knowledge and experience? Yeah, thank you, Rodolfo. Hi, everyone. Um, and I wanted to also start by saying uh, what, a, what, a, what an honor and a fascinating experience it's been to work with um, colleagues at, at MPI and, and MetGroup um, and the National Migration Forum um, on, these, on these issues. So um, my colleagues described some of the concepts that um, some recent work that we've been working on um, um, have, have found. And I wanted to um, make some of that a little bit more concrete with examples of, of how narratives have then led to policy in several different countries. And then also uh, use those examples as well to show that the types of narratives that, that we see are often not unique to one specific context. So while in the United States we're, we're used to narratives or, or, or that follow certain patterns, uh, thinking those perhaps are uniquely American, um, what we found while looking across uh, multiple countries is that there are often similar patterns in, in very different contexts uh, when large numbers of people move quickly. Um, so a couple of examples are, are here. Um, that, that I would give the United States, European Union, Middle East, and just in, in Latin America being very specific with Colombia, um, all have had um, some very recent and large migration surges of what's either, what's called in different contexts, either irregular or undocumented migration, um, or in the Middle East case, uh, it's been more, more refugees, but with uh, similar logistics of, of people crossing the border. So, um, the United States, we're the, we're the country with the largest number of immigrants in the world. We have 51 million immigrants, uh, most of whom are uh, in the United States with a visa for, for work or, or student purposes and so forth. Um, but what has been very controversial are the 11 million undocumented migrants. And then in particular, um, from 2017 to 2019, and then also starting now, uh, there have been surges of of additional migration over the U.S. southern border uh, from uh, people from Mexico and uh, more recently um, Central America. So 2019 had a million people cross the, the border um, in, in that manner. The European Union similarly had a migration surge that peaked in, in 2015 when um, refugees from the Middle East as well as uh, refugees and economic migrants from Sub-Saharan Africa um, found their way via migration trails to go to the EU. And so from 20, 2009 to 2018, 3.4 million irregular migrants crossed um, into the EU this way on boats or by foot, really peaking in 2015 with 1.8 million people um, entering that way. Um, Middle East, uh, 5.6 million Syrian refugees have gone to neighboring countries. And, and um, as, as Haya mentioned, um, Lebanon, uh, Turkey, Jordan, um, and others have been at the forefront of of hosting those. And then Colombia has had in recent years 1.7 million Venezuelans. So these are all societies that have had a very recent and, and large surge of people coming across borders um, in ways that hadn't initially been planned um, by those host governments. And what what we found by looking across these circumstances was, was um, a, a number of patterns that, um, that, that were pretty common. Um, not, not in all cases, and, and we, we did see differences as well, but ways that uh, narratives formed, uh, public opinion followed from those narratives, and then um, policies um, happened. I, I think in each of these cases, what was striking um, is that there, there are both positive and negative narratives about, about migration. Um, and the, the positive narratives were often along the lines of, look at these people in need, um, we're humanitarian people ourselves, uh, so we want to help those who are coming across the border. We're a nation of immigrants. Um, we're going to show solidarity with, with other people who need, who need help, with our, with, our, with our brothers and sisters uh, who are in crisis. But the negative narratives, uh, and, and Jaime explained uh, many of those, were often about threats. Um, threats to the rule of law, uh, when uh, populations felt that borders were out of control. Uh, threats to cultural, uh, related to cultural change or, or jobs or public services. Um, and so a fair amount of fear that was also happening um, in, these, in these contexts. Um, in, 
in all of the cases, um, I think what has been interesting is seeing the link between um, those both positive and negative narratives and the, the policies that um, happened toward migration. Um, so I think really of note is that in all of these cases, um, the receiving countries and host communities accepted a very large numbers of, of people, um, regardless of, of polarized debate and, and so forth. And I, and I think that in, in many cases speaks to generosity of societies as they um, have, have looked at you know, flow, flows of in, in, in what turned out to be often very desperate um, people. At the same time, um, countries have reacted um, as well by um, a, a lot of focus on border control. And we know that specifically in our, in, in our own country, in the United States, um, with the, the focus on securing the border, whether it's build the wall or, or more recent um, um, emphases on various types of policies to, to reduce flow. Uh, but the European Union also had similar efforts. They increased investment in, in what's called Frontex, which is similar to the Coast Guard. Um, they worked with um, transit countries, uh, uh, offering them assistance to, to not let migrants out uh, so that they could cross into the EU, such as from, from Turkey or in, in parts of Sub-Saharan Africa, the countries that were along the migration trails um, and, and so forth. Um, so we, we see this, this, this mix of, of policies between accepting people, strengthening borders, and then also figuring out what do you do with those people once they're, once they're in, a, in a country. Um, and we saw, I think, a fair amount of variation on, on that with some places, such as in the Middle East, um, not wanting to recognize uh, longer term um, um, a potential of people to stay, and so not allowing them to uh, work in the labor markets and so forth. And then others, EU or US, um, that have really opened their labor markets. So um, uh, I think those are some very concrete examples of how we saw the, the, uh, the, the events lead to narratives, lead to public opinion and policy. And I'll pass it back to... Uh... Thanks very much, Shelley. Um, I love that already we have four questions, no? <laughs> which um, uh, I think that we can go into that. Um, I'm, I don't, I'm going to open this no, for, for the four of you. Uh, and I would like to start with a complicated narrative. No? Katrina Burgess is asking us about what uh, your perspective on this narrative of deserving migrants. Does anyone want to start? I can start and then maybe my colleagues can layer in. Um, one of the interesting findings from the study was that the same values can be used to justify directly opposing policies or narratives, especially when it comes to uh, using a moral framework or the notion of justice. So when we look at a deserving narrative or the narrative that um, migrants have uh, withstand, withstood so much uh, hardship and pain to leave their countries. Oftentimes they're going through a, a perilous journey. So they deserve uh, our support. They deserve economic resources. The same moral framework that's making that argument um, around empathy and justice and morality and doing the right thing and responsibility, all those same values are, are also being used and a directly opposing narrative saying that local communities, um, local populations need to be a priority, not migrants that are coming from other countries. Um, so if migrants are deserving of, of resources, protection, jobs, rights, then local populations also deserve those rights. And I think this is one of the important points that Natalia was making is that trying to understand how these values are being used to trigger different narratives is critical. And so there was another question um, in the chat about methodologies. And I think the methodology um, that we are using and that Metropolitan Group has pioneered in terms of narrative shift and what we call public will building is really about understanding the underlying values that drive these narratives and then using formative research to understand those values and then create, develop, and test new narratives that are locally developed, locally owned, and locally driven so they can be resilient 
and, and effective and long-term. I can jump in quickly too. Um, I think I made some, some excellent points. Um, and just to build on that quickly, you know, if you, um, if you set up um, uh, this, this paradigm of the deserving refugee, it can backfire um, or the deserving migrant or deserving refugee it can backfire in a couple of different ways. Um, Heim highlighted one, one important way, which is that begs the question of what about the rest of society, particularly at a time when lots of people are feeling uh, a sense of insecurity or precarity um, and the, the recovery has been uneven uh, for many swaths of society. Um, so it sets up that competition, um, but it also um, sets you up for distinguishing different categories of migrants. Um, so when you elevate certain people as particularly deserving or exceptional, um, you, you sort of create this divide um, among migrants, which is not necessarily helpful from a policy perspective um, and gets you into very tricky territory of, you know, what, what do people have to bring to the table to be accepted and can that acceptance then be taken away? Um, and it also, um, just a last quick point, it also sets up um, this you know, it, this problematic thinking of very exceptional people as, um, uh, as, 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 as the exception to the rule. Um, so, you know, if you, if you elevate certain um, people like immigrant doctors um, as, as heroes or um, as exceptional contributors, um, then, you know, again, you sort of create this divide between those who sort of rise to that level of contribution and others who might never be able to attain this ideal that you've set out. If I may, I, I would add to um, what Natalia and Hayam just said with, with an example in the Middle East of, of, of I think is the, the question of put deserving um, Migrants. So, in the in the case of the Middle East, uh, Syrian refugees uh, went to neighboring countries, and uh, there was naturally a lot of humanitarian assistance and support from a variety of agencies, from UN agencies, from from donors such as the the, the U.S. and the EU, and so forth. Really focusing on the needs of the the refugees because they'd fled a warfare, they didn't have means of earning a living. Um, a lot were very vulnerable, um, etc. And so, aid naturally flowed from from that. Um, um, that understanding of what the needs were. Um, but then uh, local populations often started getting pretty frustrated, noting, hey, I'm poor too, um, but this other person is getting assistance um, that, you know, just despite similar needs in um, this local environment, really weren't being given. And that was leading to a lot of resentment against, um, against the, the refugees. And so as, as Natalia had mentioned, you know, sort of pitting groups off against each other through those, through, through the, through those policies and narratives have, had led to tension. And so over time, what that led to was recognition that um, assistance really needed to help all of those people, the, the, the refugees and the host communities who had similar needs. And I think, and, and you see a lot of um, um, as humanitarian assistance policies now requiring that some element of host community is included um, as well. Thank you, Shelley and Natalia. Ali, do you want to add something? So I want to address both Brenda and Marta's uh, question. Uh, but before going into that, I'm seeing that Felipe's uh, comment and question is really linked to the study. So I would like to address that first. And what he's asking is if we have found any significant difference in the results of perception in Latin America compared to other regions. Uh, you know, in the study, uh, I remember that one of the cases was Colombia. Um, so, no, and I can already think of a couple of things, but um, I don't know if Ali, Natalia, Haim, or Shelley want to kick this off. Don't be shy. I can talk about Colombia a little bit, um, if you like. I, I think um, what, what's been so interesting about, about Colombia um, is that um, when Venezuelan migrants first started crossing the borders, there was really a lot of solidarity with them. And uh, the, 
some of the narratives that we were seeing in news coverage and in popular polling um, was, was largely in support of, of, of helping these people. Um, they were culturally similar. Um, a lot of Colombians had remembered a couple decades previous when they had gone to Venezuela and, and Venezuela had welcomed them in terms of jobs. So there was a, a large sense of, of solidarity, but then um, uh, at a certain point, there was a, a bit of what we're calling a tipping point where that, that solidarity and welcoming um, soured uh, to an extent with levels of frustration of you know, lots of people coming in, the schools are becoming crowded, um, it, it just a sense of things being out of control with, uh, with lots of, of border crossings. Um, and so we, we, we saw public opinion polling um, show uh, declining um, over time um, with support of the uh, support for um, increased migration, but, but still a lot of support of the idea of, well, let's help the people who are here, but no more, we really can't take, take any more. Um, but throughout that, I, I think, you know, what has been so interesting in Colombia's case, which I really think uh, makes Colombia a model for the, the rest of the world in dealing with refugee situations, and some colleagues and I wrote an op-ed um, about this as well, is that Colombia became very pragmatic about the, the, the situation of the, the, of the Venezuelans, that instead of um, um, getting frustrated and refusing to integrate them over time, they developed a separate set of, of visa policies that would uh, enable um, Colombians at least to have a temporary solution uh, with dignity that enabled them to, to have livelihoods. And so they, they turned this difficult situation into something very pragmatic. And then uh, I think in, in, in my opinion, have set an example um, for how uh, these circumstances could be handled in other cases. Thanks, Shelly. Natalia, hi, Mali. Someone that you want to add in this regard? So, Go ahead, Natalie. Yeah, Go ahead, um, I think just just to quickly add to that, um, I think what we've seen by looking at different case studies is sometimes you have a set of enabling conditions that can allow a, a, a positive and welcoming top down narrative to to be created to establish itself um, and and potentially even to flourish. And so it's 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 very important to have these structural conditions in place. So again, this um, you know having a population that um, you can feel solidarity towards um, a, a, a culturally similar migrant population that speaks the same language, um, uh, has the same religion. Also, you know, another enabling condition, you know, having the leadership from the top say, this is a, this is an issue that we can handle, um, from a policy perspective and also that we should handle morally because we believe in showing solidarity and brotherhood. So those are all extremely important, um, um, you know, pre-existing conditions or enabling conditions that can give you a leg up. Um, but I think what we also learned is that they're not sufficient. And that's kind of the key of this conversation. You know, you, despite some of these enabling conditions, you can still get to the point where people feel hospitality fatigue, where they are frustrated because there's no end in sight to, um, you know, to a, a, a crisis situation. Um, that is overwhelming local communities and overwhelming infrastructure. They can be frustrated that there isn't enough international aid. Um, and you know, eventually they can also be frustrated if a, a message from the top is sort of persistently positive to the point where it seems like it's papering over certain concerns that are being felt really acutely on the ground. Um, so, you know, I think it's extremely helpful as we as we compare uh, contexts in different in different regions of the world to look for those enabling conditions, but also understand that they're not sufficient on their own. And also, can I just bring in another example? Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. So, um, you know, to contrast it with the Latin America case where we have Colombia and, and the positive narratives from the president and the regularization policy. Another example is Morocco, um, which has been a transit point for migration from Sub-Saharan Africa to Europe. It's um, increasingly becoming a destination where more migrants are resettling for various reasons, but it's also a country that um, 
it's has has um, um, been deeply in, involved in migration since you know, the post World War II era, where uh, a large percentage of the population lives abroad and um, has has resettled abroad. So in Morocco, uh, the king has been messaging very very strong positive narratives about migration, about the responsibility to uh, protect migrants, about uh, solidarity and brotherhood with migrants, especially coming from Sub-Saharan Africa, where Morocco has strong cultural and religious and political ties. Uh, and so the, the government apparatus more broadly within Morocco has also been behind this, uh, finding religious justification to talk about welcoming migrants. And yet, despite that overwhelmingly positive top-down narrative about migration and migrants and welcoming migration, um, we see in, in public polling that many people, in fact, the majority of people are suspicious of migrants or, 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 or are absorbing uh, the threat-based narratives or have negative opinions of, of migrants. So understanding, as Natalia mentioned, where that point is between, where that gap is between the top-down narratives and public perceptions or the bottom-up narratives is really important. And uh, one of the things that we found was that part of the problem that creates this gap, gap is a fundamental mistrust of governments uh, in many cases. And that could be related to general distrust and, and frustration with the way the government is managing the economy or um, a host of other issues or a, a, a sense that the government has been mismanaging the migration issue. But this, this gap between the top down positive narratives and the bottom up narratives is gonna be really important as we think about counter narratives that are more effective and resilient. Thanks, Ayn. Um, Ali, I think that you, that Haim and Natalia already touched on what you wanted, but I just want to make sure yeah, yeah, I mean, they pretty much took the words out of their mouth. Okay. <laughs> so before jumping on to uh, the next one, I want to address a couple uh, from Marta and Brenda um, in terms of what's the role of the media in journalism on the production and promotion of positive narratives on migration and the methodologies. and. Uh, two quick things, uh, Brenda, to your question, uh, I would say that the, the media and, and journalists are both um, kind of a, a channel, but also messengers. So I think that there's a lot of kind of responsibility and when we want to develop country narratives, they play a key role no? because that's where people, no? the different stakeholders are consuming the information. And in terms of the methodologies, Marta, that you were asking about, Jaime um, already uh, talked a little bit about that. The other thing that we have used and learned and, and like um, see kind of the impact that it has is a discourse analysis. No, I, when we use discourse analysis as a methodology, uh, and then understand how that is creating or setting the context for different policies. Uh, understanding, it helps you understand how the context was created to foster different policies. Uh, I don't know, Natalia, Ali, Haim, Shelly want to add anything on these two items. I, um, in speaking to kind of the, the role of the media in this, and we've touched on this in different ways, um, you know, oftentimes I think we, you know, we'll urge media to kind of tell as simple a story as possible about migration. And I think what we're learning, at least as the forum, is that that's actually been to the disservice or to the detriment of our efforts to help the public understand uh, uh, more migration. Because um, I think in the study, we found that um, people appreciate the complexity of the immigration narrative. And that when we allow it to be papered over, I think as Natalia said, um, it just kind of, it leads to a uh, kind of a sense that people are feeling like they're, they're being, you know, their, their concerns are being dismissed. Um, so I think that, you know, helping uh, the media tell a complicated story about really a complicated uh, reality of migration is really, really important. I'll drop this into the chat, but 
Uh, back in 2018, uh, Amanda Ripley, who's a journalist uh, and does a lot of writing about conflict and uh, um, kind of the, the nature of conflict, she wrote this incredible essay called Complicating the Narratives. And kind of as advocates, as for us, it's something that we have really tried to, to internalize. Okay, how do we uh, kind of tell a complicated story, tell the complicated story about migration in as clear a way as possible? Um, so, you know, I, I just wanted to kind of zero in on that term complicated and I just, you know, urge us not to kind of oversimplify things. I'll jump in um, with just another comment about the media. I mean, one thing is the story, um, you know, different media outlets are telling, but a whole other issue is what people are motivated to consume. So we're in this landscape where there has been an explosion of sources of information. Um, and so people can cherry pick the information that they're willing to consume much more than they ever could before. So with you know, different social media channels, um, local networks, international media, it, you know, the, the very first hurdle is um, you know, what people choose to read and beyond that, what they choose to believe or simply dismiss out of hand. And it's very much tied to questions of identity because we know that, you know, when that, that these, you know, these very controversial policy questions um, tap into people's feelings of identity and kind of get entangled with them. And once, you know, your views about immigration are um, tangled up with feelings of how you define yourself in general, then of course you're gonna seek out information that confirms what you already believe and that affirms your own identity and place in the world and sort of dismiss other things out of hand. So the problem, you know, runs um, even deeper than what media is conveying, but it's also about the sort of psychological processes at play that affect how people seek out and consume information in the first place and what they're even willing to, to entertain. Well, thank you. Thank you, Natalie. Um, I'm seeing two more questions and I'm going to read them out loud. Um, this is, well, it, because it was sent to us, I don't know if the person who wrote it feels comfortable sharing the name, so I'm just to, I'm going to read the comment on the question. Uh, it seems easier for, for politicians and other leaders to gain support by frightening their constituents than by inspiring them. Is this just the way things are, or are there any narratives about the role of politicians that would stigmatize those who demagogue the immigration issue? If so, how do we promote those narratives of responsible leadership? And the other one, no, and I will give you time to think of, about the answer for that one. The other one is um, also sharing that we are, we are is someone that supports a number of, of US-based not nonprofit organizations that work at the intersection of works, workforce development and immigration refugee rights. And she share, uh, sharing, we are consistently challenged with how to productively frame the contributions of immigrants to justify additional support for career pathways. We recognize that this can trigger negative thinking around exceptionalism or deserving immigrants. Can you please provide examples of productive framing for the economic workforce contributions of immigrants? Well, a lot of this, I, I mean, to jump in here, I mean, these are both really, really important questions, right? Um, and in the first phase, what we wanted to try to do is get a sense across these six countries, how the migration narrative was playing out, again, kind of what was driving it, uh, um, and but also what was missing in terms of better understanding um, how to proceed. So in the second phase of work, what we really want to start to do is uh, better understand who are the messengers um, and what are the messages that whether it's from you know a top-down perspective or probably more importantly kind of the bottom-up perspective um, actually begin to shift public perception. 
um, particularly kind of with res uh, um, with response to the, the economic development or the, the economic side of this. I think that uh, there's a lot of great work happening on the cultural side now, at least in the states. Uh, but we all we, we continue to run into this uh, the buzzsaw of um, the economic fear that immigrants and refugees are are takers of programs, services, jobs. Um, so a lot of this, at least from my perspective, um, is kind of part of the second phase, but um, I don't know what others think. Yeah, thanks, Ali. I, I would add um, on, the, on the labor market and you know, workforce question, I think this is one of the really interesting things um, that we're finding looking across these different country contexts is just how different I think the workforce issue is, is was one topic that really has very different narratives according to 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 context, um, and so it was interesting seeing the interplay of what 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 local labor markets like, and then what narratives were around um, around immigrants. So, for instance, in the Middle East, um, one of the biggest fears about the refugees um, is a narrative that they're going to take jobs, and so they're very restrictive labor market policies about uh, refugees working. Um, and that's, it, it's a bit of a catch 22 because they're not allowed to work legally, but uh, there isn't enough aid for them. So they have to work anyway. So they work underneath, under the table. And so it's, it's sort of a downward, a race to the bottom of, of, of you know, be, just people being able to support themselves. Uh, everyone knows they do it anyway, but they're not allowed to do it legally. There's, there's a, um, um, a, a lot of pressure just uh, on that issue. On the other hand, in, in Sweden, what was, was interesting was that a lot of the discussion around labor markets and migrants were, were a bit different. It was not so much that they were competing for jobs, but that uh, many of the, the migrants who had, um, who had entered Sweden were, were lower skill and had a lot of trouble adapting to the Swedish labor market with language and, and so forth. So instead there was worry about well, what happens with the community that really can't integrate um, into, in, into labor markets. Um, and then so, you know, all the other countries were kind of in the middle and, and the US had you know, pretty competing narratives on that, you know, as, as many of us know. And on the one hand, there's concern that um, um, migrants, whether low skill or high skill can, uh, can take jobs that, that American citizens have. On the other hand, uh, business community in particular often is saying, look, we don't have enough people, we need some more. So um, such a wide variety of narratives around uh, labor market um, but it was clear that in each case, um, the labor market job issues were, were hitting such sensitive nerves. And I think this would be something that's really important to dig into to understand you know, what, what leads to these different types of narratives in different contexts. Um, and what are they positive and what are they negative? And, and you know, what are the, the, the contextual factors as Natalia had noted that, that set, um, that, that set uh, societies up for having certain types of discussions along those lines? Okay. That's really key here, just saying that this is sort of why we're arguing for this more forensic analysis of, of you know, what is, what is driving these concerns and how do they all intersect? Um, because, you know, arriving at that diagnosis is a really important part of then being able to construct a narrative that is inclusive and um, that that also that also resonates with people, and you know, one of the first things you um, you have to do is acknowledge people's concerns. So I think you know, one of <laughs> we can't say that many general things about what what works. Though I know that's what everybody's question always is, and I wish we knew and <laughs> sort of had the answer. Um, but I think one of the general principles um, that that we do see emerge um, is that it's, you know, it's problematic when people are feeling, um, you know, certain concerns and anxieties and, and people are everywhere. Whenever there's, you know, social upheaval and change in people's lives, um, there's always a period of adjustment and a set of intersecting concerns. And I think just highlighting the, benef the possible benefits, especially when they accrue to society at large and might not necessarily apply to the individual person in question, um, or at least not evenly everywhere, um, you know, that, that, that can be a hard case to make sometimes without first acknowledging that, you know, there, there is hardship and there are, there are challenges and that people, you know, aren't crazy for, 
um, for, for, for being in this, in the struggle sometimes. Um, so I think that's, you know, one of the, the sort of things we would add to the, um, immigrants as contributors frame that it has to come hand in hand with that acknowledgement on the other side. But also I'd like to um, address the question about uh, leadership narratives. So the question um, is making the statement that it seems that it's easier for politicians and leaders to gain support by frightening their constituents and driving these fear-based threat narratives. And the question that was posed is, is this just the way things are? Um, and I think the reality is, is that a lot of people sometimes um, feel overwhelmed and frustrated, whether it's migration policy or um, marriage equality or any other issue that we care about. And so in many cases, there's just this, this feeling that, well, that's just the way things are. There's nothing we can do about it. Um, but really, it's not the way that things have to be. And Rodolfo, the work that you've done in Mexico on anti-impunity and fighting corruption really tackled this question. And when you started that work, um, there was this general feeling that corruption and impunity is just endemic and that's just the way it is and it's always gonna be that way. But through the public will building work and the narrative shift work that you and your colleagues at ISMG did, you started to see a shift where people recognized uh, that it didn't have to be that way. And so I think going back to the question of methodology, you know, using public will building, using narrative, change methodology that really dives in and does the formative research to understand people's values and understand the values that are driving different narratives um, is really important if we're ever going to develop those counter narratives that promote anything from you know responsible leadership or uh, more humanizing migration policies. So really understanding the values is key to making those changes long lasting changes? And uh, the short answer is, uh, yes, it is possible to make that change. And as no, as, and I think that as we have experienced, it, it takes time no, and a lot of like good discipline no, in the implementation. And I think that Jaime just answer also a friend's question on how, uh, what we can recommend. No? And I think that the public will building and kind of putting a strategic communication lens to the work that everyone's doing that that um, that is something that we can recommend you know? like and when we talk about strategic communication lens we're talking about have clarity on the goals you know identifying the stakeholders that will help you achieve those goals understanding those stakeholders and then developing and implementing a, a strategy and monitoring and evaluating yeah, um, Natalia, Ali, Haim, Shelley, is there anything um, that it's burning that you want to share at this moment that you haven't shared? You're setting kind of a high bar. We all are, I think, and yeah. I think that this has been a, a very exciting conversation. And uh, Natalia, as you were saying, like the, um, I love the the word like forensic analysis on how to, like, understand deeply what's uh, moving these and why these narratives are being so entrenched you know, in many in many levels. Someone was sharing on the on the chat. Um, a, a reference back to the 19th century. Um, around, yeah, so I mean, so I mean, this, this is like a, a long history. So I guess I would just add, um, and this is actually an ask of, of folks who are uh, watching is that, you know, if there are very specific questions that, you know, you think we should be digging into in the second phase as we're scoping out the second phase of work, um, quite frankly, as we are kind of trying to identify the resources. So, you know, with the, the resources we need to, to, if we're able to raise the resources, it's not just kind of developing and testing 
kind of narratives to kind of push back or, or kind of realign the conversation, but it's also doing pretty in-depth case studies across uh, a number of countries. So we just have a deeper understanding of kind of how top-down narratives are successful or not successful, um, but then also, you know, how these very powerful and insidious bottom-up narratives are emerging uh, um, and being weaponized by, you know, other policymakers. So if there are specific questions that you have um, that you think, you know, we should be digging into, please let us know. And we're also going to be pulling together an advisory group uh, 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 so that there's just more consistent uh, engagement. So again, please, you know, reach out to, you know, uh, any of us um, with ideas or comments. Kelly, I know you wanted to add something else around methods. Yeah, so um, both your, your, your question, Rodolfo, about anything else to say, and then also there was an earlier question about methods. I, I think I, I comment a little bit about both. I think when we started considering these issues, um, we, we looked at our at migration experience and, relative, and literature and so forth, and then, and then recognized that in multiple different country settings, and I think you'll look across the panel and see that we've all worked in different regions of the world, um, we, were, we were seeing um, populations reacting uh, to certain issues, which we were calling hot button issues. And those could be, I think we, we discussed jobs, but um, you know, in addition, cultural change or crime and security or terrorism, or um, during the pandemic health and, and, and what happens when flows of people are moving and what that does to, um, uh, for, for health. So we went in with a hypothesis that, that uh, there are a number of hot button issues and then wanted to understand what was going on with that. So um, we did an in-depth literature review that was structured around some of those issues as well as the, the types of actors that, um, that, that uh, use narratives, whether they're politicians or the media or uh, uh, some social media, the general public, um, looking at opinion polls and so forth. And then really tried to you know, come up with our, our, our findings based, based on that. And, and I think through that is, is where we, we came up with some of these overarching um, conclusions that, that, that we had. But uh, so as I said, I wanted to mention both methods and um, just a, a last thought. And I, and I think it's, I think what was a motivator of, of working together on these issues, we're really seeing uh, the American press in, in, in other countries, just such shrill polarization around particular um, issues um, dealing with with migration and recognizing that these were not all just country specific. The you know up, upset about people crossing a border or how migrants are treated or um, you know right, but that's not just an American issue that that happens you know around the world and wanting to really understand what was what was feeding into that. So uh, yeah, so both a comment on, on 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 the methods and on you know what why we thought this was important to do. Thanks very much. Um, I don't see any more comments, questions on the chat. Um... So I'll jump in um, Adolfo, to just um, touch on one of the comments that was already made in the chat, which I don't think we fully delved into, which was this issue of, you know, how can we, how can we create narratives that present migration as something that benefits the whole community? Um, and I and I think that really gets to the to the heart of um, this this challenge, and I and I think what's interesting with the different case studies we looked at is you can see that there are different paths to doing that. Um, there's you know um, invoking people's sense of moral duty um, or compassion or tapping into how people define themselves vis-a-vis -vis migration, um, as well as the issue of economic benefit. Uh, but one thing um, that, we, that we also discussed in our report is this issue of practicality and pragmatism. And, you know, it sounds a bit, um, a bit mercenary maybe, but sometimes it's also about just, um, you know, tapping into um, what people can can plainly see is a workable solution rather than sort of high morals or identity questions. Um, you know, I think sometimes showing that um, being inclusive is actually a, a sort of practical approach 
um, at a time when, you know, not dealing with the migration that is at your doorstep can be quite catastrophic for society and sort of, you know, pretending that people aren't entering um, irregularly um, or that people aren't working under the table, um, sort of ignoring, you know, these, um, you know, dysfunctional things that are that are happening, not in accordance with the rules we've all set out, um, can be extremely disruptive. And so, you know, we saw, um, you know, in you know, Colombia is another great example. Um, there, you know, there was the moral case. There was lofty language about brotherhood and solidarity, but also a very practical case to be made um, for, you know, the the right way to manage. Um, a situation that could otherwise create huge upheavals um, in in people's lives, and I think we we've seen that people do respond to those practical arguments, and that's one way of um, you know painting this picture of what we can do that's that actually works for the whole of society. Thanks, Tom. Hi. Thanks, Roto. Yeah, I'd like to just make one one last point, um, and that is that the the mapping of migration narratives and understanding the weaponized narratives and how they form and how they spread that we that we did in this first phase of work is really important. But what I think that is urgent and critical now, as we move into the second phase of work, is to really do the formative research to to understand the underlying values driving these different narratives, to understand the gaps, to develop the effective counter narratives and message frameworks that are resilient and locally owned so that NGOs and advocates and service providers and policymakers at local and national levels can start using some practical tools and using uh, more effective counter narratives to push back on these on these weaponized and threat based narratives, so we can have a reasoned policy debate. We don't, you know, there there are plenty of positive narratives out there, as we've talked about, but there's this real gap in positive narratives that are actually effective and resilient, uh, and that are sticky and work. So there's an immediate gap that we need to fill through the formative research, the social listening, the polling, the focus groups, the stakeholder interviews. It, so, so that can inform and create this knowledge capital that we can use to develop the counter narratives and then go into the testing and refining of these narratives. So um, that's the work of um, not just one small coalition of partners, it's gonna take a much bigger coalition of partners and stakeholders, both nationally, but also internationally of civil society organizations and policymakers, national governments, local governments working together. So please, um, as Ali mentioned earlier, please let us know if, if this is something that you're interested in, if you wanna be a part of this, uh, there's a lot of work to do and, and there's a lot of um, space for, for, for this work. Ali? Back to you. Sure. So I, I guess um, just to begin to, to wrap this up, um, you know, phase one, we learned a lot. We identified a number of uh, gaps in kind of, or I think, our collective understanding of, of the issues, uh, not just as organizations, but I think also as the movement. Um, and that, you know, ultimately, look, narrative shapes policy. Um, so we have got to figure out how we are shaping the narratives that lead to the policies. Um, that we're all fighting for day in day out. It's kind of as simple as that. Um, and so, you know, from you know from the past, from the perspective of the forum, we're just really excited about uh, the work that comes that's coming ahead up. And again, please reach out if you have questions, ideas, um, and ways that you'd like to participate. Thank you, everyone. Um, you can stay in touch with us by email or through our digital channels. Um, the email that we have created for this is migration at medgroup.com. Uh, also, our panelists are completing the report uh, titled How We Talk About Migration, the link between migration narratives, policy, and power. And it will be available soon for uh, as a free download. 
Eh, what a conversation. Thanks, everyone. Gracias por sumarse a esta conversación el día de hoy. It's been a, a pleasure, and we will continue our work, our conversation, and looking forward also to hearing from you eh, on this issue. Thank you, everyone. Thank you, everyone. Thank you, Rodolfo. Great to see everyone.